fire at the property and you can still see there's still flames. That was actually my wife's teaching resources that she'd collected for many years are still going up in flames. Uh, books burn for a long time. So those of you who are students probably find that amusing. As a teacher, I kind of do in, in, a, in a deep way as well. So. <laughs> uh, so yes, we'll go to the next photo. Um, that's our driveway. Um, Dad, you were asking me about the tray of my ute, where it is. That's that thing in the foreground that's still burning there. That's why I don't have a tray on my ute anymore. Um, and yes, um, so that's our driveway. That's one of our cars in the driveway on the right-hand side there. And that's once again about an hour and a half after the fire. We'll go to the next photo. Um, this is the car that my wife and my oldest boy were in and got caught in the fire, in the smoke, went off the road, couldn't see where they were going. And um, you can't see very well, but uh, they, they were smart enough. I'm in the CFS and we learn a lot about radiant heat and how damaging it is. And they were smart enough when they got caught to stay in the car and keep their heads down um, because radiant heat goes straight through glass. But in the back corner here on the right-hand side, um, bottom right, you can't quite see. There's two straps there. They're the straps that go around the plastic petrol tank. All right? The plastic petrol tank isn't there anymore. About 10 minutes after they got stuck, the back tyre caught on fire, and Katrina was smart enough to go, we've got to get out of here. All right? There was still trees burning all around them, things like that, but they managed to get into a neighbour's old stone building um, and hide in that stone building, and they were very lucky. They were, they were definitely protected by angels that day. Right, they were in a situation where most people um, would not have survived, all right? but God was watching over them incredibly. Um, they made some very, very, very wise and timely choices, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't just them. I'm pretty sure there was someone else watching over them. Okay? Uh, if we go to the next photo, um, that's a close view. That was our bedroom right there in the front there next to the car. I was looking at this bottom corner. I was thinking, that's where all my clothes were, and there's nothing left. It's like there's not even ash or anything. I mean, I have a few clothes. And Katrina has lots of clothes. Um, <laughs> so, yes, that, all that iron, that was the roof of our house. And um, yes, and that's and one of our other cars sitting there in the driveway. Katrina came back after that car got caught down the road, thought, well, maybe we can take the other car. And she took one look at the house and left this car and went, yeah, we're not going anywhere. And they were actually stuck on the property for about three hours until our neighbours, who'd also lost their house, managed to come back to the property and found Katrina. I was out in the fire truck, so I couldn't get back to them. We were elsewhere fighting the fire. And um, so they were there, you know, stuck there. I knew they were alive, because they managed to get through to me on the mobile phone before the phones went out. But they were stuck there for about three hours, just with smoke and stuff all around them. So very scary. Um, so next slide. To give you an idea of the intensity of heat, that's the rear parcel shelf of that car. That's the rear window melted into the parcel mm. shelf. Now, I'm not sure what temperature glass melts at, and toughened glass melts at a higher temperature, but that's, yeah, that's melted glass. So that's fairly intense heat, as you can imagine. And I think the next one's the last one. Oh no, that's, for the farmers or retired farmers among you, that's uh, burning chicken manure that they use to spread as fertilizer. It smells wonderful. <laughs> It smells wonderful when it's not burning. It smells even less wonderful when it is burning. And one more photo. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a three quarter of a million dollar combine harvester. And two tractors behind it and a grain bin. But those of you who've seen John Lush on the news, uh, he's a Malala farmer, that's his. Um, and uh, just shows you the devastation. I don't know if you can see, if you just go back one second. Uh, there was a closer photo. The only thing that survived and didn't lose its paint on this particular harvester was the red fire extinguisher. <laughs> 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 so you can just see it in the middle there. The, the, the green of the John Deere harvester all burnt off, but the red fire extinguisher somehow survived. So, and then the last photo, this is actually taken about a week ago. That just uh, shows you just what the devastation is to the local, um, like, I mean, the grasslands are all destroyed, but all of the trees, a lot of them won't come back because they're sugar gums and they're actually too badly damaged by the intense heat. Some of them will, but um, yeah, that was only taken a week ago uh, by me. So um, it's pretty devastating what's happened up there. But the reason I wanted to share, and I won't go on too much longer, is just the fact that it's not about the devastation, it's actually about the rebirth and re-life that's come through community. And we've been incredibly blessed by the CFS community, by my school community, by our local church, Salt Church in Gawler. Um, but also by the Adair community. Um, you guys have no idea, and I'm trying to get emotional, because I can, 
um, the blessing that you brought to us in an instant. I think Peter Manuel said the term, this is a socks and jocks situation. And we literally, I, I had my CFS uniform, that's the only clothes I had. Katrina had just one pair of clothes. And we kind of needed to do something instantly. And Adair, Adair, the Adair community was a huge part of that because you responded instantly when we needed it. And I just want to say a heartfelt thank you um, to all of you for, for being there in our time of need. And I, I love, I'm looking for the opportunities to pay that forward to people um, because it's important that we do that. And, uh, and so I just want to say a big thank you on behalf of myself, my wife and my family um, for being there in our time of need and for the blessings that God brought, you know, just the miracles that God brought on that day. And I watched the fire run across the paddock from the fire truck and I couldn't believe it. You know, I've seen a few fires and uh, the speed of it was just unbelievable. There's no way you can stop something like that. Um, and it's amazing that it didn't do more damage. So, so a huge thank you from the Birthwood family. Thanks. Just before you go, will you join me in prayer for Andrew and his family? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for blessings. We thank you for the privilege of being able to just share with each other the, the blessings that you've given us. But Lord, at this moment, we just bring Andrew and Katrina to you. We just pray, Lord, that uh, their story may be told, that people would, as he said, pay it forward. But Lord, most of all, we just pray for their safety, their protection, and their future. The plans uh, that God has for you, Andrew, that Jeremiah 29, verse 11, is the word for you today. God knows the plans he has for you. And they're plans of good not of evil, but there's some good things coming your way. So, Lord, we just thank you for Andrew and Katrina. We th pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank and I think it's good just to be able to put a face to what we've been doing here at Adair, which is absolutely marvellous. Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Again, Lord, we thank you for this morning that as we come together, we come with expectant hearts because we know that you're going to speak with us this morning in a powerful way. And Lord, as we leave this place, we know that we will be going out that door after having had an encounter with the living Lord Jesus. So prepare our hearts, Lord. May we open our hearts, our ears and our minds to hear what you are saying to us this day. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. need that I'm about to play golf <laughs> loved the worship thank you Peter and your team for that Loved the choir thank you Leslie and your team for that music gets into us and does something to us doesn't it really does sometimes if I'm a if I wake up in the middle of the night I go and turn on some praise music and worship music and just let it soak into my spirit it really does something to you. It brings you into the presence of God. Now, I don't always like all styles of music. I'm not much of a jazz fan, really, but I want to tell you a story about someone who was, a guy called Hoagie Carmichael. You may have heard of him. He was a jazz singer and composer and musician and whatever else he did. Very accomplished from what I hear. I haven't turned it on to listen to him, but I must now. I see there's some good nods around the place. Well, he decided he wanted to do something else. He decided a bit later in life to take up golf. Now, the garage sale yesterday was fantastic. I wandered around. It had everything, kitchen sink included, I think, but it didn't have a golf club. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Ken and Leslie, but they couldn't. Ken kindly offered to bring one, but I didn't need it because I know that we have the power of imagination. Now, Hoagie Carmichael decided to take up golf, at a, as I said, a little bit older in life he was, and so he wasn't going to just step out onto the golf course and get into it. He hired the best instructor that he could find. It cost him a lot of money. And so before they stepped out on the golf course, Hoagie went through all these instructions, how to stand correctly, how to grip the club, how to swing, 
all those sort of things. Ken's laughing at me, I haven't quite got it right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really important how you do it. So Hoagie Carmichael endured about an hour to an hour and a half of instruction before the instructor finally said to him, OK, Hoagie, I think we can go out and have a practice shot. So out they went onto the tee and he bent down and put the ball on the tee, stood there, got the swing just right and the feet just right and did the practice shot, mandatory they say, and here it goes, whack. And he watched the ball go right through the air and it went off a bit. Then the wind seemed to catch it a bit and it came back and it plopped just on the edge of the green. People were just breathless because there was still some motion of that ball. It was moving and it rolled across the green and teetered on the edge of the cup and then just dropped in. He turned to his caddy and said, here's the club. And he turned to his instructor and said, well, I think I've got the hang of it now. <laughs> <laughs> Only about that simple. <laughs> but I want to say, there's an old saying that you're never too old to learn. We can always learn something. And I, I remember as a little chap praying this prayer, Lord, I read the story of Solomon and I was so amazed at the wisdom of Solomon. And I remember praying, Lord, give me wisdom. What is wisdom? Psalm 90 verse 12 says this, Teach us, Lord, to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. What does that mean? Now, I don't want to be all morbid and that sort of stuff, but it means we're not here forever. It means that we need to get our lives in order. We don't know the days or the hours that we might have, but it means that God wants us to have a relationship with him and wisdom is that we would talk with God about where we are in life and what he wants for us. It doesn't matter which rung of the ladder you're on in life, whether you're down the bottom or whether you're at the top of the ladder, it doesn't matter. God is wanting to connect with us. There's an amazing little story about an old lady sitting up in a hospital bed, reading her Bible as a doctor came in. And the doctor asked what chapter or what verse she was reading and she told him, and she said, look doctor, no one's telling me anything here, how am I going? And he said this to her, read Hebrews 13:8. So they had a bit of a conversation and after she'd gone, she looked it up and she looked at Hebrews 8.13, not 13.8, which says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And the doctor was meaning to say to her, she's about the same, but she looked up Hebrews 8.13, where it talks about the law becoming obsolete. And this is what it says. Now, what is obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. <laughs> so don't mix up your verses. <laughs> I, I was talking with a pilot not that long ago, an international pilot. I've known him for a little while. And he was saying that when he was practicing learning to fly, one of the things he and the other students did was with the open cockpit of the plane, throw a roll of toilet paper out and let it unravel. Then they'd go off and scoot back and see how many times they could cut that with either the propeller or the wing before it hit the ground. But the thing that really amazed me about what he was talking about was this. He said, when you're in the air and you see the stream of toilet paper rolling down to the sky, just drifting through the sky, he said, it seems so far away and then it's there. It happens so quickly. Life is like that, I believe. Life is like that because the things that we sort of wonder about in time, they are a long way away, then suddenly they're upon us. And I think that is a gentle reminder to you and to me to make our hearts and our lives right with God. What am I talking about? Well, I'm certainly not talking about religion. Religion is people trying to do all the right things, earn their way to God. A lot of people are religious. They think it's tied up with rules and regulations. If we do the right thing, if we say the right thing, 
even if we go to the right places, we're going to be okay with God. That's religion. You see, Christianity is different to religion. Christianity isn't doing all the right things. We can never do all the right things. We've messed up and our sheet's in a bit of a mess already. But Christianity is God seeing the mess that the world is in and putting into action an amazing plan. We read in John 3.16, that favourite verse of all of us here probably, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Power words. It means that God saw the mess we were in and came down to us through Jesus. He came down to sort out the mess that we had made. He came down to put it right. He came down to take away the sin of the world. What if I could, could say to you there is a secret formula to understanding who God is and who Jesus is and what it's all about? Who likes secret formulas? Who wants to know the answer? I think everyone wants to know the answer to life. I'm delaying telling you. <laughs> you know, you ever watch those shows on TV where the music's playing and the silence and you think, come on, tell us who won. There is a secret formula. There is a secret that we can all hold on to and discover what it's all about. What is it? John shared it with us this morning as he read the scriptures. But did you pick it up? It is a secret. Well, I don't know there's so much a secret, but it seems that we just don't talk about it. We don't discuss it. We're too busy making a living. We're too busy wondering what's going on. Where do we go from here? We're too busy trying to understand what life's all about. Maybe we're too busy with garage sales, not necessarily here, but in all the busyness of keeping our lives in order, cleaning up the rubbish. We're so busy that we focus on what's going on in here, out here rather than in here. What is this secret formula? Here it comes. This is a verse which we should know off by heart. It's a verse of scripture which will actually change your life if you hold on to it. It's Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. All the things that, that people chase after, money, fame, power, it's wrong. Before we make any decisions, we should be talking to God about that. We should bring it to the Lord in prayer. We need to hear his voice. It's no secret, really, this formula. But the scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What are those things? Well, John shared before, talking about storing up stuff on earth where moths and rust destroy. 